Elaine Canning is the executive officer of Swansea University's International Dylan Thomas Prize, one of the largest literary prizes in the world for young writers. And currently, she is working on her first short story collections. So, Elaine, over to you. Welcome, everybody, to the beautiful Lyric Theatre. Um, it's nice to be home. <laughs> I'm from Belfast originally, but I currently live in Swansea in Wales. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce two wonderful award-winning novelists, uh, Mr. David Park and Mr. Patrick Gale. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having us. And um, we are delighted to be talking today in this session about places called home. Um, both David and Patrick have uh, recently published new novels David's novel, Travelling in a Strange Land, is um, it's a wonderful novel, which has recently won the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year Award. Many congratulations to you, David. You have to be modest about these things. <laughs> <laughs> and Patrick's novel, Take Nothing With You, has just been long listed for the Polari Prize. So congratulations, Patrick. So these are two beautifully evocative, poignant novels, um, very different, um, but there are a whole number of interconnecting thematic strands that run through these novels, um, such as dynamics of family, love, resilience, um, relationships with place. And so we thought today we would begin by talking about the interrelationship between fiction and nonfiction. Um, so David, I wondered whether you might um, say a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit about the experiences and relationships that have shaped your writing. Well, I have just finished writing uh, my first non-fiction book, uh, which is called Here is a House, which is about my parents and the house I grew up in, Belfast. Um, and it was quite a strange transition writing from fiction. And something I, I realize, I don't have that many profound thoughts, but I, I did sort of think something that felt quite profound. I felt that truth was in the fiction. Mm -hmm. When you come uh, to write factually, you start to make choices, um, what should be in, what should not be in. And I was also very mindful of Oscar Wilde's statement that uh, man is least himself when he talks in his own person. So, um, I wanted to write about my family, my parents, and uh, the house, and how that house influenced what I came to write. I um, developed a strong resentment against my parents as I wrote, because they were very kindly, good parents. <laughs> they, there was no trauma in our house, and what, what use? What use? in the modern world is a, mem a memoir without trauma. So that, my parents were Baptists, um, fundamental in their theology, but not fundamental in their lives or their thinking. Um, so I had quite a, a happy childhood, but I was deeply, and continue to be deeply influenced um, by that experience of evangelical religion. It never actually got to oranges are not the only fruit, uh, unfortunately. But the kind of imagery of the stories that I heard, that I, the first stories I ever heard as a child were from the Bible. Um, I, I spent a huge number of hours in that kind of church setting. The language of the authorized version of the Bible became kind of coiled around my brain. And some of the, some of the important symbols of uh, the Bible are, are still, I think, prevalent in, in my writing. Mm -hmm. So, Patrick, in terms of your writing, um, in, in terms of nonfiction, um, and that relationship with, um, with your novels generally and how they shaped your writing, um, what about your relationship with, with family, with parents? How do they feature in your previous novels and in this one? I, I, my life is one long apology to my family, really. The moment, <laughs> the moment I think, I forget, there's some American wit who said when, when a, a novelist is born into the family, the family has had it. Um, and I, 
I, my, as far as I'm concerned, family is my subject. I, all my novels are very psychotherapeutic. They drill down into families, and it's basically my family, time and again, and, and thinly disguised versions. Um, my sister is very sweet. She says she rather enjoys reading my books, so she does so with a kind of trepidation as to what will have been unearthed next. Um, but there's such an interesting parallel with David, because I also had this very religious upbringing. I, I owe my father especially uh, a lot when it comes to my, my love of English prose. He, he was the son and grandson of a, of a priest, and I think would have been a priest had he not married my mother, and they went to church maybe three times a day in retirement when they had the time to do it. Um, and then I was sent to a Church of England choir school, so I was totally immersed in the King James Version and sang the Psalms every day. And I think if you do that to an embryo novelist, it can't help but affect their, their, their love of language. Sure. Um, would, you, would you like to read for us um, perhaps a little non-fiction piece about, yes. about yes, your relationship bit, I mean, with I your parents? I think the, the most notorious thing I've done to my poor family um, was on television. I, I wrote a, an original drama called Man in an Orange Shirt to mark the partial decriminalization of homosexuality, the, the, the 50 year um, anniversary. And in so doing, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the little piece that, that, that explains it. It was June 1984 in a Vietnamese restaurant in Pimlico. I had taken my mother to the revival of On Your Toes for her birthday treat and had fed her very first crispy duck pancakes. I was 22 and living in a bedsit in Notting Hill Gate. I had never formally come out. It would have seemed a little redundant because I'd been a wildly camp little boy, much given to dressing up even for school, and an aesthetically obsessed teenager who had spent all his spare time on music and acting. The closest I would ever have come to had been handing my mother the manuscript to my first novel, The Aerodynamics of Pork, a few weeks earlier. Still in print for the charitable and curious, this is a wild fantasy in which almost every character has a lesbian or gay secret. So, I finally asked, when she didn't bring it up, what did you make of the book? It was lovely, she said unconvincingly, funny and naughty and oh so sad. Now I'll think every policewoman I see is a lesbian, Oh, and your father read it too. I hadn't counted on this. My father's preferred reading veered wildly between two-volume lives of Victorian archbishops and thrillers with submarines on the cover. I loved him. He was always very kind to me, but we were not close, not confessional in the way I had always been with my mother. I would sit at the foot of her bed to talk as she rubbed in her night cream. I never did the equivalent with him. She saw my consternation. One of nature's performers, an effortless hogger of limelight and stealer of thunder, she needed no encouragement to make the rest of that evening's conversation about her. <laughs> it will help him come to terms with himself, she said. 23 years earlier, while heavily pregnant with me and preparing to move the family from Governor's House, HM Prison, Camp Hill, to the equivalent mansion in Wandsworth, she had taken it upon herself to tidy out my father's desk. She came upon a sheaf of letters tucked away in a drawer, saw that the first began, My Darling Michael, and gleefully sat down to read, assuming them to be from some girl he had never mentioned. Only they were from his oldest school friend, who had gone up to Oxford with him, fought alongside him in the war. They had been one another's best men. But maybe they were just very close, I suggested. Men back then often had deep romantic friendships. Darling didn't always mean she cut me off, espresso cup wobbling. It was plain from the letters, she said, that my father had shown the man a passion he had never shown her. Plain, too, that their last night before their wedding had been spent in a hotel room. She burnt the letters, terrified in such an era that their discovery would see him arrested and sent to one of the prisons his friends governed. In the early 60s, discovery would have spelled a ruin as complete as in the wild era. Her next responses were stranger and more damaging. She never told what she had discovered. 
She simply never let him in her bed again, encouraging the adoption of, single, of separate beds under a single hypocritical quilt, and then separate bedrooms. And thinking herself as the wife and daughter of prison governors well-versed in such sordid matters, she assumed the revelation meant he was a paedophile, so thereafter she saw to it that he was never left alone with any of us. I had not one private moment with my father until he retired in my teens and I began to make tentative discoveries of the near stranger I began encountering in my weekday breakfasts. She was happy that this story excited me. Suddenly I understood my father. Suddenly his emotional inhibition and his complete lack of demonstrative behavior made sense to me. It was only as I waved her off on her train back to Winchester the following morning that I realized her gladness had a completely different meaning to the one I'd clumsily assumed. She didn't realize she was telling me a horror story of stifled love and a marriage built on lies. She honestly believed, having read my novel of tangled gay love lives, that she was offering me hope that I too might yet meet a good Christian woman like her who would burn my past and mend my ways. I don't for one moment think of my father as having been gay. That term simply doesn't hold for the men of his ambiguously homosocial generation. I think he had one great love, but that he believed it was impossible and immature. Psychologically, he was suited to becoming a bachelor history don, harboring secret favoritisms and cared for by a devoted housekeeper, but he held it was his Christian duty to marry and have children. So that's what he did. I have their letters from their courtship in early 1950s Durham, where he was my grandfather's young deputy at the prison. It's plain that at some point in the courtship, there was a muffled crisis brought on, I think, by his attempt to confess everything about himself and by her inability in her ferociously maintained innocence to deal with it. And I don't think the impulse to infidelity will once have entered his mind. Ironically, by never telling him what she had discovered, she maintained him in the belief that he had indeed been saved by her. And though wildly unsuited in many ways, they found a kind of companionate love, especially once an empty nest removed any pressure to function as a traditional couple. But in that Pimlico basement in 1984, after two decades of believing myself a family freak and someone living outside the law, making my legs and arms and scalp bleed from eczema as my guilt and fear erupted through my skin, I had abruptly been awarded the validation that comes from genetic inheritance. I was very like my father in so many ways. I favoured him physically, but I think we were alike emotionally as well given to sly observation and irony in situations where my two older brothers would respond with open anger. Like him, I would always choose solitude over a crowd, a book over a party, and like him, I learnt early on to hide my social reluctance with courtesy and correctness. So learning he might have been like me, had he only been born 40 years later, made me understand pity and warm to him. And yet, like my mother, I found I could never tell him what I had learned. I showed my new love in code instead, in books and bottles of whiskey, and in invitations to visit me in my new life in Cornwall. He was deeply supportive of my two long-term domestic relationships, settling my share of family silver on me, much as though I had got married, and doing his best to love my partners and make them welcome in his turn. My show, Man in an Orange Shirt, is not about Pippa and Michael Gale. I've written versions of them repeatedly in my novels, but it has at its heart that terrible scene of discovery and letter burning. However, in the drama, I've imagined how differently things might have played out had my mother confronted my father, and like so many couples of their generation, achieved a terrible, respectable compromise. Writing it, I gave voice to my father's stifled passion and pain, 
but I also came to understand the impossible burden my poor mother took in marrying him and how it must have affected her. Thank you. I'm going to read the first uh, paragraph and then just a few other lines from um, my first non-fiction work, which is not published, uh, which is called Here is a House. Um, my father was born in North Belfast and all his family were in North Belfast. And in 1954, he heard that there were new factories opening in the east of the city. And with his wife, he decided that he was going to move from North Belfast over to the east, to the top of the Castlereagh Road, almost really where the city reached the countryside. And we're talking about a city um, whose housing stock had been decimated during the Second World War and the Blitz. So it was the prospect of a new start his family thought he had lost his mind. They had never ventured out of North Belfast. They thought he had gone absolutely crazy. And I don't remember after we actually moved, I don't really remember them coming to visit. It must have felt to them like the edge of the known universe. <laughs> so, in the first paragraph, I'm trying, I'm just born, and I'm trying to imagine what it was like. They, built, they bought a newly built house, a semi-detached house, 16,000 pounds, and took 25 years to pay the mortgage. So, here is a street, here is a house, newly built, perhaps the mortar between bricks still puzzled by the light streaming down from the hills that unfold the city, the putty holding the glass not fully hardened so that if pressed it might bear a world fingerprint forever through wars and the moon tides of lives to be lived in these houses and their future diurnal role of existence. In empty rooms, there is the smell of plaster drying out. Perhaps in some corner, a surf of yellow, brown-tipped wavelets of planed wood, a discarded crust from a metal lunchbox or paper bag. The air is still tentative, untrammeled yet by laughter or tears, and the rooms echo, do strange things to the voices that project what has not yet been, but which slowly forms in dream perfection and whispers a new freedom from what has now been left behind. Moving through the grey interior is like walking on the moon, even though it has not yet been walked on, because everything feels weightless and pioneering in the cities. For at the city's furthest horizon, its grid of lights left behind for roads recently led, electric newly connected, and strange stars unfettered in the night sky. The edge of the world, the edge of dreams. Number eight, here is our street, here is our house. When you write about yourself and your uh, family, as Patrick has revealed, there are painful moments. And um, I'm just going to read a few lines about a painful moment. My father uh, got a job as a laborer in one of the factories. Uh, went to work every day on his bicycle, came back at lunchtime, had his lunch and went back on the bicycle. Um, that bicycle was very important in our family. Every Saturday night he went down the Cassaray Road and came back with fish and chips. And it didn't matter if it was hailstoning or torrential <laughs> rain. My mother put the plates out on the hearth to warm and he got on his bike and went. 
And um, this is something that happened in my primary school class. And uh, it's called Shame. A cold snow about the heart. I am eight or nine years old and in primary school. The teacher is bored, as she often is, and looks for ways to amuse herself. Starting at the first desk, she asks each pupil what his or her father does. There are more than 40 children in this class. I have plenty of time to think. In my mind, the word labourer sounds lowly, less desirable than what the other children are saying. When it comes my turn, I steal our neighbour, Mr. McElhenney's occupation, and say my father is a bread server because it sounds a higher status job. Down the spinning fista of years, I hear a cock crowing three times. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I think from those uh, readings, non-fiction, it just highlights to us how, how complex the dynamics of family are. And um, I think that that moves us really nicely onto the, the novels themselves. Um, David, your, your novel, um, it's Tom's story, um, travelling from Belfast to Sunderland to collect his son who's ill, to get him home in time for Christmas. And your, your novel, Patrick, is about Eustace, um, who at the beginning of the novel is in his 50s, but we go back, uh, it's really a story about his coming of age, isn't it? Mm. Um, and most of the novel is focused on those important years, um, teenage years. Um, so I, I wondered whether we, we could talk a little bit about family relationships in both of the novels, because it seems to me that we're dealing with very complex relationships, lots of secrets, um, lots of uh, survival tactics, and we've got absent sons, we've got relationships between parents and children, but I think we've also got, in the case of Eustace, substitute family members. Yes, I mean, it, it seems to me that one of the reasons why the some of us novelists seize on family as our subject is that it, it, it's a bottomless subject because it's doomed to fail. <laughs> one, one of the things I find very touching about, about the, kind of the family experiment is we keep trying um, and there's this impossible ideal handed down to us by the church or by our grandparents or whatever and, and it does, it is nearly always doomed to fail. So it's interest, you're, what we're doing is writing about interesting failures and that, that sense of failure to match up. And Eustace, as an only child, has all those extra pressures that only children have, because he is the only child, therefore he has to be everything his parents want, and of course he, he often feels he's none of those things. And his mother um, is deeply disappointed in life, and uh, she resents, like a lot of her generation, she's exactly my mother's generation, like a lot of her generation of women, she feels deeply disappointed that she's ended up a wife and mother and is not doing something more interesting. And she certainly didn't expect to be running an old people's home in Western Supermare because um, she was a girl in pearls in country life. So there's that, that tension right from the start. Absolutely. And obviously that impacts upon Eustace himself growing up in that environment um, where he's surrounded by elderly individuals. He's the only child. Yeah. And, and he's a sponge. He, he, he picks up on on emotions, Absolutely. dark emotions. He can't always put them into words, but he senses. I mean, both his parents, in their different ways, are having a kind of breakdown, mm -hmm. um, and he, he picks up on that. And, and the making of him is quite by chance stumbling on classical music and discovering he has a gift, because that lets him, if not speak, at least give voice through music to these difficult emotions that are, that are welling up in him like a volcano. And it also brings him into contact then with a range of, of people who do become almost like substitute family yeah. members, would you say? Uh, yes, I, I quite often, um, as a sort of out and proud 50-something, I often get called into schools now to talk to, to teenagers about sexuality. And I always say to them, you have to bear in mind that friends of yours who are doubting their sexuality are probably having to elect new families. And I think we all do it. And a lot of straight people do it too, because your parents don't always come up to snuff and you find other mothers, other fathers. Um, that's always the ideal at school. You hope you'll find a teacher who's like a, a father or mother figure. Um, so yes, Eustace does this through his teacher. He finds her, um, the, the gay men who she lodges with mm -hmm. in, in, in Bristol, apparently provide the perfect family. Of course they don't, because no family is perfect, but it, it's a family structure that speaks to him. Absolutely. David, has Tom got the perfect family? 
No, no, there's no such thing as the perfect family. <laughs> My book is, is from the father's perspective and about how to be a father, which is a difficult thing to know. And you don't ever know it. You just stumble uh, through it and hope gradually you get it right. And uh, just this week, by coincidence, I was tidying my study, um, something I do regularly every five years. <laughs> I found this little note that I have kept, and it's from my son. He had a Saturday job, and uh, it involved, it was at Christmas, it involved taking customers' turkeys out to their cars. And the note says, Dad, I have borrowed your coat for carrying orders to cars today. If you need it back, just call. And I just thought, you know, th that is the proudest thing I have from my son as a father, that he borrowed my coat. <laughs> um, and it just, um, uh, the book is about, uh, as Elaine said, a journey from Belfast to, Sun to Sunderland. My son went to uni in Sunderland, so I made, actually made that journey not through the snow, that's entirely imaginary. Uh, but I did make that journey, I don't know, maybe six times. And it was perhaps the most intimate moments as a father with the son in the car as we came, came back. Mm. You know, fathers and sons, I think, without falling into generalization, tend not to talk as openly or as intimately, perhaps. So we talk about football, we talk about music. He touches my heart because he's made a, you know, a little CD of songs to play in the car. And um, we just talk about nothing, but it feels, it feels intimate. But if I could just digress, when I wrote this book, which is also about a father and son largely, I came to the end of the book and I felt I was obligated somehow to say something profound about how to be a father. But did I know what it was? No, I, <laughs> no, I did not. And it was doing my head in. And then I went for my six monthly um, eye test, Boots Forestside, the optician, Deborah. <laughs> God bless her. She does the eye test. And this is what I subsequently uh, wrote. What was it she had said to him? What was it she had told him to do? Look into my light. That was what she had said, look into my light. And he knew that was what he must find a way to say to his son, but find a way that didn't use the meaninglessness of words. It wasn't ever going to be a beacon that would blaze his son's path painlessly through the confusions of life. But let him look into his father's light, however small a spark of grace or holiness still smouldered there amidst the ash. And despite everything that happened, use it to guide his faltering steps through the darkness until he found his own direction. <sighs> my, my son tells me he has a Father's Day card and he hopes to deliver it soon. <laughs> He, he only lives about 20 minutes away. <laughs> I, I am harboring the suspicion he's holding it for next year in the hope that I forget that he hasn't delivered it. I think what's really interesting about both of these works is that they, in terms of place, they move around, don't they? So obviously Tom is on this journey from Belfast to Sunderland. Um, and even Eustace, he lives in Weston, he goes off to Bristol, he goes to Scotland and so on. But what really struck me about both of them is that for the majority of your, the novels, even though we've got various recollections, reimaginings and so on, they are in enclosed spaces, aren't they? So Tom is in, in the car with his memories and recollections and Eustace is in this lead-lined room receiving radiotherapy treatment. So I just wondered about how you negotiated place and space within, within those works and what challenges you faced in terms of developing your characters through, through place. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think sometimes um, it's by setting yourself a limitation as a writer that you set your imagination free by saying, right, I'm going to tell the story, but it's all going to be set in a car or a hospital mm -hmm. room. It, it actually does you a favour because it fires things off in your head. Um, so the, I really enjoyed the fact that I couldn't take modern Eustace outside this room for 24 hours. He had to be stuck there just remembering. Yeah. And what about you, David? How did you find it challenging keeping Tom within the confines of the car for that, for that period of time? Yeah, uh, well, I had this voice in the back of my head. You get voices in your head when you write, and they're not always helpful. So I had a voice in my head saying, David, a guy in a car, a middle-aged guy in a car, this is going to be really, really boring. Here's what to do. Have something dramatic happen to him on the journey. You know, mm -hmm. have all these dramatic things. And um, thankfully, I just silenced that voice and I just um, had very little external drama. But you did, you did bring in, um, we did get the voices of your son and your wife through telephone calls and so on, and the daughter. So we get the, these aspects of Tom's life coming, filtering through into, into the car, into what is seemingly private space. But there's still no escape from family within that space. And I think the same is, is true for Eustace, that it's actually there where all of his memories well, come yeah, flooding back. I think both books illustrate the way we, we, we carry our families in our heads. I mean, both my parents are dead, but they're still very much Absolutely. in there. I'm um, disapproving. <laughs> um, yeah. Absolutely. So in terms of the titles of, of the books, um, I mean, obviously, in both cases, the titles are very strongly interconnected with action. So traveling in a strange land, you know, we have Tom taking on this epic journey through the snow with the beautiful lyrical descriptions of landscape um, to, to rescue his son. Um, and Take Nothing With You relates to Eustace being in this lead-lined room and he knows that when he leaves the room he can't take anything with him. So he is radioactive for 24 hours and whatever, whatever is in that room stays in the room. And I think in both, in both novels, um, I think though they are novels about family and, and about relationships with others, I think a, a huge part of both of these novels is also about self-love and self-protection because I think in both cases including with Tom there is this this shedding there is a shedding of of layers of or certainly a way of trying to deal with grief and having to leave certain memories behind leave certain photographs behind in the in the case of Tom I'm so struck by your choice of job for Tom the the, the idea of the photographer who photo photographs scenes of would-be happiness, of weddings and of, you know, lovely occasions, but it, it's sort of making himself invisible in the process. You hide behind the camera. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I think it worked for me, but it, originally it was a mechanical decision mm. um, as opposed to a kind of philosophical decision. Mm. The guy in the car needs to be someone, so I considered a range of possibilities. Right. I did think at one point of making him a school teacher, but having been one for 34 years, I thought that was not <laughs> going to... A bit close to the bone. <laughs> no, it wasn't going to yield up much that was interesting, I thought. So, uh, so I, I, just, I, I just thought a phot photographer, and then from that decision, other things then developed, and it's, it, it allowed me to... Uh, you know, uh, explore certain things and experiment with certain things and bring certain imagery and that was uh, complementary to the overall uh, idea of the novel. But it started off just being, well, what is he going to be? I thought what was really useful, though, it's, um, and interesting, was that he, though he, he does this professionally, he also has his own little secrets connected with photography, doesn't he? So there's the picture of Lorna that he, that he keeps that she doesn't know about. There's the pictures of of the son um, that no one else knows about that he discards in the end. Um, and I just wondered whether you might read us a little, a little piece from the, from the novel, um, which connects him with that, where we actually have him talking about his photographs. Uh, there are two sons in this book, the one he's driving towards and the son who's lost. And part of the book is about uh, the search for the lost uh, son, and he's looking for his son in Belfast every night, walking the streets. And as he walks, and as he looks, he begins to take photographs. 
During these nights, I take the photographs, the shadow of railings that have a child's red shoe on one of the spikes, presumably in the hope that it might be reunited with its owner, the white spidery scrawl of new graffiti on a derelict building that has grass and willow herb growing out of its broken crevices, a smeared neon transfer in a shop window that looks like oil and water, the rows of Belfast bikes in their docking station with their grey metal glistening under street lights. And I come to understand the truth of what Ansel Adams said, that you don't make a photograph just with a camera, but that you bring to the act all the pictures you have seen, the books you have read, the music you have heard, and this is true, I think, of any art form. You bring to the act all the pictures you've seen, the books you've read, the music you've heard, the people you've loved. It feels like the closest I've ever been to finding that moment under the surface of things, the closest to that I've ever felt in understanding who you are, as if somehow these photographs also glimpse what exists in you just below your surface. So they're special to me even though I've never shown them to anyone. And I realize that the city itself is a palm pest, where behind the bland uniformity of chain store shop fronts is an older and still enduring glimpse of what once was. I see it above the glass where the solidity of red brick and smaller shaped windows are untouched by time. And in my dreams, offer the possibility of what might be once more. It makes me wonder if when the snow finally fades, the world revealed beneath will remain unchanged, or will it be altered in some unexpected way? I think we, we can't finish without talking about the, the role, the function of music in both of these novels. Um, Patrick, turning to you first, I mean, obviously the cello, classical music, is absolutely integral to, to Eustace in terms of his, his growing up and his um, connections with himself and with others. Um, would you describe it as transformative for Eustace? It is. I mean, I wanted to show, because it drew very much on my own childhood, how um, training in something as rigorous as classical music can give a child <laughs> resilience and help them to withstand the shocks of life. Um, sure. And whenever people ask me, you know, how do you find the discipline to get your books done? Because I, they are, I'm, I'm a very, I think of myself as a very undisciplined, rather neurotic writer, but they do get done regularly. And I always realize it's, it's music, it's my early music training. Um, if you take a child at seven and you, you make them work that hard, the habit goes very deep. David, it's popular music and the yeah. bond in between father and sons in the book. Yeah, um, we've yeah. got everything, don't we, from Johnny Cash to, to Moby. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. a bit of a rocker, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Music for me is a constant all day long, and it's, um, it calms me, it motivates me, it's just, like, it's just like a soundtrack I need. And this morning, uh, as soon as I got up, I put Aretha Franklin, uh, Whenever I wake up, before I put on my makeup, I say a little <laughs> prayer for you while combing my hair and wondering what dress to wear. I say a little prayer for you. I would never write another book if I could have done that. That's just absolutely, and her voice, it's just, it's just the best poetry. It's That's like, in my top five songs as well. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Well, it's a short story, though, because I love the way right at the end of the song you realise he's not in love with her yet. <laughs> I may not even know she exists. Yeah, yeah. And the thing too from Patrick's book I felt about music was the incredible, the passion for it, the absolute passion, a transformative passion for it that was felt by young people, uh, even, even in the process of learning. And I'm deeply envious of anyone who actually can play an instrument. Never think, too late to learn. <laughs> well, yeah. So, um, would you like to read us a little piece about, I think it would be a lovely way to finish in terms of music. music. A bit about music when Eustace first hears Carla Gold play. When he very first hears it, yeah. okay. Without giving away too much plot, um, one, one of the, the godparents, the literary godparents of this novel is the go-between. So, um, 
It's a very much a novel about an adulterous affair. And this is a scene where the entire family's life is changed. So you've got to think yourself back to the 1970s and um, all the women wearing lovely clothes and all the men looking terrible. <laughs> the recital happened in St. Joseph's, the Catholic Church, which was an adventure in itself and was given by a cellist called Carla Gold, who had inexplicably moved to the area from London and a pianist from Bristol. Eustace was resentful at missing World About Us since he disliked changes in routine but forgot everything. Television, homework, the hardness of his chair, the moment Carla Gold strode onto the stage. She was young, younger than his mother, and tall and very striking, with a great mass of tawny, curling hair like a mane, a dramatic nose she regularly turned aside on her longer bow strokes, and hands and arms as gracefully controlled as a ballerina's. Her pianist was as glamorous as she was and wore white tie and tails which set off his olive skin and neatly trimmed black beard. He had an exotic surname. Persian, apparently, his father informed them, rather too loudly. Or must we say Iranian now? They played two sonatas, the third Beethoven one and the one by Rachmaninoff, and for an encore, Carla Gold returned to the stage alone and finally spoke. Her voice was warm and lightly accented. Told you, his father told his mother, again too loudly. She was born Goldberg or Goldstein. They often do that. His mother shushed him and he laughed, nudging Eustace so they could be boys together, united against the impossible woman with whom they lived. Thank you so much, Carla Gold said. I'd like to play you the prelude from the third Bach suite. It begins with a C major scale and arpeggio, which my incredible teacher, Jean Kerwin, always said was all anyone learning the cello needed to play for their first year. And I like to think it shows Bach taking an instrument which until then had been largely for accompaniment and demonstrating just what it is capable of. It begins with a C major scale, a downward scale, an arpeggio, and then he opens the range out and out until it soars like a great C major eagle. So, there was a titter and then an awed hush as she sat back on her piano stool, thrust out a shapely sandaled foot to her left, gazed up at the top left-hand reaches of the church, took an audible breath as though about to sing and began to play. She didn't simply play the notes. She played as though urgently communicating. Listen. Her playing said, this really matters. Eustace was enthralled and clapped so enthusiastically when she was done that his father laughed and his mother murmured, not the harp then. Had Carla Gold silenced the applause and said, now you must leave everything behind and follow me wherever we must go, Eustace would have obeyed her without a backwards glance. On that note, for now, please join me in saying a huge thank you to the brilliant David Park and Patrick Gale.